One of the basic tenets of moralistic therapeutic deism is that everyone goes to heaven when they die. I picture it as something like this. Three men are standing in a line waiting to be admitted to heaven one day. And apparently it's been a pretty busy day. So Peter has to say to the first one, listen, heaven's getting pretty full at the moment. Uh, and in fact, I've been asked to admit only people who died particularly horrible deaths. So what's your story? Well, the first man says, for the longest time, I've suspected that my wife was cheating on me. So I came home early from work one day in the hope of catching her red-handed. As I came into my 25th floor apartment, I could tell something was wrong. But after all my searching, I still couldn't find the guy hiding or where he was. Finally, I go out onto the balcony and sure enough, there's this guy hanging over the railing from the 25th floor. By now, I'm really mad. So I start beating on him as he's hanging there and I'm kicking at him. But wouldn't you know it? He wouldn't let go. So I ran back into the house and I grabbed a hammer and I came out to the balcony. I'm smacking away on his hands. And finally, his fingers slipped. He falls 25 floors, but lands on the bushes beneath our apartment in the front garden. He's safe. Well, that's it. I go inside to the kitchen, I grab the fridge, I bring it out and I heave it over the balcony. He falls down and he's dead. Finally, vengeance. <laughs> but the exertion of moving the fridge gave me a heart attack and I died. Right there on the balcony. Well, that sounds like a pretty rough day to me, says Peter. And he lets the man in. The second man comes up to Peter. Peter goes through the same spiel. Heaven's getting a bit full. Let us have your story. We might be able to let you in. So the second guy says, oh, it's been a strange day. You see, I live on the 26th floor of my apartment building and every morning I do my exercises out on the balcony there in the sunshine. Well, this morning I overbalanced over the rail and I had to grab onto the balcony and slip down but luckily, I caught hold of the balcony on the floor below and I'm just kind of hanging there, shouting out, hoping that someone will come and save me. Finally, someone comes through the door out onto the balcony, but instead of helping me, he starts whacking at my hands and kicking at me. I hung on as tight as I could. And he went away and I thought, oh, finally he's going to get some help now. But he comes back out again with a hammer and he starts banging on my fingers and banging, banging, banging. Well, I couldn't keep that up for very long. I eventually let go, but as luck would have it, as I fell 25 floors down, I landed on the garden out the front of the apartment block. Whew, this is my lucky day, I thought, until I looked up and suddenly there was a, a shape covering the sun. <laughs> Killed by a refrigerator, of all things. <laughs> well, once again, Peter had to concede that that sounded like a pretty horrible death. So the third man comes to the front of the line. Peter goes through the whole process. Heaven's getting a little bit full, only letting in uh, uh, particularly sad stories today. What's your story, buddy? Well, the third man says, picture this, I'm hiding naked in a fridge. <laughs> so there you are. Three different reactions towards waiting. Waiting for vengeance, waiting for justice, and waiting for punishment. If today's the first time you've been in chapel since Research Week, we've been reflecting on the consequences of the pandemic. In particular, the possibility that the true and living God has commissioned this season of plague as a wake-up call to our modern globalist society. Guided by Paul's words to the church in Thessalonica, I've suggested 
that now more than ever we must abandon the modern demon of therapeutic moral deism and emulate the faith of the Thessalonians that Paul describes in chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. 1 Thessalonians 1, 9 and 10, the churches in Macedonia tell how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, who re- whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. Pivoting has become one of the buzzwords of 2020, So it seemed appropriate in my first sermon to focus on the beginning of life as a Christian, that is, turning from idols to worship the true God. And during a season of plague, this looks like believing that God is faithful to his word and to his world and therefore holds sinners accountable even to the point of death. More than this, though, it means trusting that in Jesus the Christ, God takes death personally for us. And as we saw last week, during this unique time, serving the true and living God by doing the one thing that the world cannot do for itself, namely proclaiming our hope in the resurrection of the Christ for the forgiveness of sin. This week we'll take the opportunity to meditate on the promised future for life as a Christian. That is the future of waiting for the return of the Lord Jesus, who saves from the coming wrath, as Paul told the Thessalonians. Now that story uh, I just told has a fairly typically worldly attitude towards life and death. So I'll proceed by turning those three scenarios, the three men's stories, into a question. With the help of one Thessalonians, let's consider whether, firstly, are Christians waiting for vengeance... Secondly, are Christians waiting for justice? Or thirdly, are Christians waiting for punishment? So firstly, are Christians waiting for vengeance? Well, the answer to that is no. Christians are not waiting for vengeance. They're waiting for vindication. First man in the story was certainly looking for vengeance. He suspected his wife of that particular treachery that only a spouse can perform. And what's worse, he was found to be justified in his jealousy. So he sought revenge on the interloper, the classic crime of passion. And he was led into heaven. But is that really what the Bible teaches us about waiting for the return of Jesus? As we've noticed in the last couple of weeks, you soon get the distinct impression that turning to God from idols to serve the living and true God is far from easy. Let me remind you again from Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 6. You became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering with joy given by the Holy Spirit. Or in chapter 2, verse 14. For you, brothers and sisters, became imitators of God's church in Judea, which are in Christ Jesus. You suffered from your fellow citizens the same things those churches suffered from the Jews who killed the Lord and the prophets and also drove us out. The Thessalonians suffered considerably, it seems, at the hands of their own people, probably even their kith and kin. The history of Christianity in this city began with persecution of the missionaries who brought the gospel there in the first place, as we see in Acts chapter 17. They were run out of town like common criminals and handed over to the angry mob. Paul and his friends knew that not much would change for the Thessalonians even after the missionaries had left. So we read in chapter 3, verse 2 of 1 Thessalonians, we sent Timothy to strengthen and encourage you in your faith so that no one would be unsettled by these trials. You know quite well that we are are destined for them. In fact, when we were with you, we kept telling you that we would be persecuted, and it turned out that way, as you well know. The exact details of what the Thessalonians suffered is not described in the letter. We know from the Acts story that it involved being brought before magistrates on false charges of treason. Beyond this, from an historical point of view, there's good evidence to believe from from around about that time, Christians were soon imprisoned for being atheists, because they refused to worship idols. 
They were accused of incest because they loved their brothers and sisters in the Lord and they were charged with cannibalism because they shared together the body of Christ when they celebrated the Lord's Supper. Before long, it was deemed public entertainment to watch them be torn to pieces by wild animals or drenched in tar and set alight like torches in the emperor's garden. So were the Thessalonians waiting for vengeance? Is that what the gospel encouraged them to do? No. The gospel of our Lord Jesus encouraged them. It encourages us to wait for vindication. The vindication of our Saviour, the Lord Jesus. Look again at chapter 1, verse 9. You turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his Son from heaven who rescues us from the coming wrath. We trust that we will be rescued from the coming wrath by means of the vindication of Jesus the Christ. According to the New Testament narratives from very on, early on in the church, Psalm 110 was understood as David's prophecy concerning the vindication of God's Messiah over his enemies. The apostles first preached this message at Pentecost. Let me read to you from Acts chapter 2. This is Peter speaking to the crowd from verse 31. Seeing what was to come, David spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. God raised this Jesus to life and we are all witnesses of the fact. For David did not ascend to heaven and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. The gospel message from Psalm 110 is that the good news that God has raised Jesus to life as proof that he is the true king over all the earth. But more than this, when God raised Jesus to life, it was an act of vindication. Vindication of the sacrifice that Jesus made at the cross. The sacrifice he made was acceptable for the forgiveness of sins. God vindicated Jesus against his enemies and all the enemies of salvation who persecute his people. It was history's biggest reveal. Forget about fatties and figures or hipsters and home renovations. When the Messiah returns, he will be vindicated against his enemies. The vindication of the risen Jesus over all the earth. This is what Christians are waiting for. Jesus, the only truly good person to whom bad things happened, this Jesus will be vindicated by God against all those who oppose God and his plans for salvation. We confessed it earlier as we stood. At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is the hope that inspired the Thessalonians mentioned in chapter 1, verse 3. It's the hope of all those who confess Jesus as Lord that one day at his return, having been vindicated by God, Jesus will gather to God all those who belong to him. Paul describes it for us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. The Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God and the dead in Christ will rise. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and so we will be with the Lord forever. Those who trusted in the promise of forgiveness through the cross, those who hoped in the resurrection of the Christ will have their trust vindicated before everyone who caused them to suffer for it. It's the ultimate loyalty program cash in. But what then of the wrongs that we suffer? If we do not wait for vengeance against those who have wronged us, and some of you may well be victims of the things like the spousal betrayal, and if not, I'm sure you know someone who has, if the return of Jesus will not bring us revenge like the first man in the story, will there be justice? Are Christians waiting for justice? 
As difficult as it may seem, we do not look forward to the return of the Lord as an opportunity for justice, but for mercy. Remember the second man in the story? He's certainly a hapless victim. A simple accident gets him entangled in a crime of passion, but is an innocent bystander. Was, just, was this just a case of terribly bad luck, and so therefore he deserves entry into heaven? Is this the kind of justice that Christians are waiting for? As I mentioned in the first week of our series, the Thessalonians became a model for the churches throughout the world because they turned to, from idols to worship the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In doing this, in giving up the economy of religion that is the basis for idolatry, the Thessalonians also gave up their pretense that they could somehow manage their relationship with God themselves. They abandoned the notion that as long as they gave God what he wanted, they would get what they required. By turning away from idols and towards the Saviour Jesus, the Thessalonians escaped God's righteous anger towards adulterous idolatry and instead received the gracious gift of forgiveness. As Paul described it to the Ephesians, it is by grace that you've been saved, through faith, and this not from out yourselves, it is a gift from God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Since we ourselves have received nothing but mercy from God, despite our ignorance, indifference, or even downright rebellion, we've no claim on the justice of God. So as Paul told the Christians in, Rome chapter, in Romans chapter 12, do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, with all this talk of forgiveness and mercy towards sinners, how can we understand God as good and just? Will he overlook the great crimes of history? That's certainly the modern expectation wrought by the God of MTD. But wouldn't that imply also that God is somehow indifferent to the betrayals and desertion that we suffer from others? Will God simply and indulgently just turn a blind eye towards those evils at the return of Jesus? Are Christians waiting for punishment? Yes. Jesus will return as judge of all the earth and the mediator of God's wrath. Of all the men in the story, the third man, caught in the fridge, dies not only guilty, but caught in the very act that led others to sin and brought disaster on innocent bystanders. It seems only fitting that his attempts to hide his shame and wickedness are nevertheless caught up on the scales of justice. And likewise, the Gospel makes clear that those who continue to ignore God's saving grace in Jesus will one day be brought before the judgment seat of God's chosen and risen King. Paul describes this in uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. If you want to flick across 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 6, look at what Paul writes there. God is just. He will repay he will pay back those sorry he will pay back trouble to those who trouble you and give relief to you who are troubled and to us as well this will happen when the lord jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels he will punish those who do not know god and who do not obey the gospel of the lord jesus they will be punished with an everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the lord and from the glory of his might on the day he comes to be glorified in his holy people and to be marvelled at amongst all those who have believed. It's a truly terrible thing to fall into the hands of the living God unprotected by the blood of the Lord Jesus. In fact, the blood of Jesus, his death scars, will be for the unrepentant, the medium of God's wrath, as the Father vindicates his royal and eternal Son before those who blaspheme the Holy Spirit. As John writes in the beginning of Revelation, we read it yesterday, look, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, 
and all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. Again, we remember Peter's words at Pentecost. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. This then is the coming wrath from which the resurrected Jesus saves his own. It will be swift and terrible with consequences that last as long as the one who mediates God's wrath towards sin. The Thessalonians were a model to all Christians in the manner with which they waited for the return of Jesus. They waited for mercy in the light of the coming wrath. During this unique season of plague, Paul's words to the Thessalonians remind us that life as a Christian is a labour of love, a love that seeks to proclaim the unique message of salvation throughout this season and as many others as the Lord allows. We must endure, but not without hope. We who have turned from idols promoted by MTD await vindication for our faith at the return of our glorious God and Saviour, Jesus Christ. And until that time, we have his promise that God will strengthen us as we wait. Or as Paul said to the Thessalonians in chapter 3, 13, May he strengthen your hearts so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of God our Father when the Lord Jesus comes with all his holy ones.